more elaborate figure, likewise on a steel plate, is also produced by vibration. The exciting crystal is attached to the upper corner of the plate. We use sand and lycopodium. The lycopodium moves to the center of the fields and takes up circular shapes. The sand forms the lines. Each material has its own special way of behaving. Lycopodium alone, a sonorous figure, transition to a mobile flowing phase, and back again to the figure. The sonorous figures represent stationary waves. But now we can also observe moving waves. Here the sand is flowing in a current. When the wavelengths are short, these currents produce a rotary effect. Areas become defined in which the particles are actually rotating. process of visualizing sound by basically vibrating a medium such as sand or water as you can see there. So if we have a quick look at the history of cymatics, beginning with the observations of resonance by da Vinci, Galileo, the English scientist Robert Hooke, and then Ernest Klabney, and he created an experiment using a metal plate, covering it with sand, and then bowing it um, to create the Klabney patterns that you see here on the right. Moving on from this, the next person to explore this field was a gentleman called Hans Jenny in the 1970s, and he actually coined the term cymatics. And then bringing us into the present day is a fellow collaborator of mine and cymatics expert, uh, John Stuart Reed, and he's kindly recreated for us the Cladney experiment. What we can see here is um, a metal sheet, this time connected to a sound driver and being fed by a frequency generator. And as the frequencies increase, so do the complexities of the patterns that appear on the plate. For a range of DIY scientists and artists from all over the globe, and cymatics is accessible to everybody, and I want to urge everybody here to apply your passion, your knowledge and your skills to areas like cymatics and I think almost magical tool. Um, it's like a, a looking glass into a hidden world and through the 
numerous ways that we can apply cymatics. We can actually start to unveil the substance of things not seen. Devices like the cymoscope that you can see here are being used to scientifically observe cymatic patterns, and the list of scientific applications is growing every day. For example, in oceanography, a lexicon of dolphin language is actually being created by basically visualizing the sonar beams that the dolphins emit, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to gain some deeper understanding of how they communicate. We can also use cymatics for healing and education. This is an installation developed with school children where their hands are tracked, and it allows them to control and position cymatic patterns and the reflections that are caused by them. We can also use cymatics as a beautiful natural art form. This image here is created from a snippet of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony playing through a cymatic device. So it kind of flips things on its head a little bit. And this is Pink Floyd's machine um, playing in real time through the cymatic. We can also use cymatics as a looking glass into nature, and we can actually recreate the archetypal forms of nature. So for example here on the left we can see a snowflake, as it would appear in nature, and then on the right we can see a cymatically created snowflake. And here's a starfish and a cymatic starfish, and there's thousands of these. So what does this all mean? Well, there's still a lot to explore, and it's early days, and there's not many people... inside the radar, which you see there, which is a, a high-tech fabric dome, which weighs about 17,300 pounds, and it's just held up by air pressure alone. So that's mounted onto the platform. This platform is a twin-hulled, semi-submersible, self-propelled platform. And so this allows us to position the radar really anywhere in the Pacific theater, uh, whether to take advantage of a test or whether to support a defensive of approximately 37 uh, miles uh, above begins um, uh, the ionosphere extending out to approximately 620 miles and this is a region um, that, that we're interested in as it relates to HARP and there's a, a couple of ways that um, HARP is, is utilized one is um, these early devices were actually called ionosphere heaters they were originated in the former Soviet Union um, they took a long time to reset uh, to vary the frequencies the HARP system can reset in very rapidly. They have the ability to control it in a way that allows them to change frequency and change configuration um, pretty readily. It makes it one of the most versatile, if not the most versatile, ionospheric heater uh, on the planet. It's not the only one. Uh, there are uh, ionospheric heaters in, the, in, in what is Russia today, uh, northern Canada. In fact, Rosalie Bertel did some work on the ones in Canada. Uh, there's a, a system here in Europe, the uh, uh, IZICAT system, and then there's uh, China actually is developing their own. So these are kind of proliferating uh, a little bit around around the world. Um, this is uh, the idea of focusing the energy, starting uh, graphically. This comes again from Bernard Eastland's view graphs. Uh, the array on the ground focusing into the ionosphere, uh, into a small area, which is then heated. And the idea is you can slew the beam, you can move this a beam approximately 30 degrees, so you can actually heat a, a fairly good area, approximately uh, 30 miles in diameter, and when you heat it, you can actually lift uh, the ionosphere up um, several uh, um, hundreds of uh, kilometers, and then the idea is that lower atmosphere uh, moves in, and we'll talk about what that can be used for. Um, in fact, I'll mention a couple things now. One is um, altering pressure systems below, weather pressure systems below, which kind of fits into the topic that is actually on the menu for the day. Um, the 
the other is the idea of maybe diverting uh, jet streams as, as part of that concept of weather modification. And then the other, and this came out of the Strategic Studies Institute in London, and it was from Russian research, the idea of utilizing these kinds of instruments for incoming um, objects from space, comets, asteroids, and the like, normally would have that 30, 37 miles um, to create friction for an astronaut. for reduction of global warming. We have 150 patents. Why would they make patents if there wasn't something going on? Why would patents go all the way back to 19, the late 40s? We have a long list of patents, again, about 150, and the exact ingredients we see in these patents, this one was assigned to Hughes Aircraft in 1991, oxides of metal. Why do they use metal? Why do they use aluminum? Because aluminum reflects, and that's, that's the stated purpose of these programs solar radiation management to reflect the sun. The rub is they're destroying Earth's natural protection by doing this. How much sense does that make? So I began looking for what the materials were that were being used and why. Now, there's an awful lot of technical material behind what you're seeing. For one thing, these particles, these nanoparticles that are being put into the air, not only help to shield the ground from the sun and block, and reflect the sunlight, which can change the temperature of the air mass below that, make it cooler, make it come together and compress but it can also be bombarded with microwave radiation from the ground. And if you match the frequency of these particles in just the right way, these particles will begin to heat up in the air, and that heat is transferred to the surrounding air mass. Now, it only has to be a mild amount of heat. It could be 135 degrees, but if you have countless trillions of these particles suspended in the air, that are all being painted with this signal. They will all heat up at the same time, Microwave. and they will carry that air mass and all the moisture that's in it to a higher altitude where it will condense and become a powerful low pressure system. Now, people question whether it's possible to manipulate the weather, to steer the jet stream. You have to remember that when you put a coating over a surface and it cools down the air mass below that, the air comes together, it condenses. When you heat up the air mass, it rises and expands. And so by controlling where and when these events occur, you can actually control the flow of the jet stream. A few years ago, it was discovered that the amount of snow that fell in the Himalayas near Mount Everest would actually control where the jet stream went over the course of the following year. And that's just one location on the planet ball right here was a red Basketball. blood cell, something you can't even see without a microscope. You could line 50 of these particles up next to a single red blood cell. That's how tiny they are. They can be absorbed right through the skin, and of course, there's almost no filtration system that you can wear that will prevent these things from being introduced into your body during respiration. It was an Air Force study. United States Air Force study that was conducted between 1993 and 2001. It was called In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat Alveolar Macrophages. It sounds real technical, but all it says is aluminum nanoparticles have a toxic effect on the white blood cells, part of your immune system that exists right in your lungs, in the alveoli, the little air sacs that expand and contract when you breathe. 
Okay, this is your first line of defense against infection. So if you are able to suppress the activity of the immune system in the lungs, it means that anything else you put into the air, it'll go right into your system without your... Because we wanted to make uh, the weather a little bit better. There will be monsoon failures during that period. There will be huge hurricanes. The global studies indicate there will be some impact on precipitation patterns. It might involve large-scale regional agricultural disruption lasting a number of years. Potentially, two billion people could have their food disrupted by such interventions. That the aerosols can, at least in these model simulations, or indicated by these simulations, can offset most climate change in most places most of the time for both precipitation and runoff. But it's likely to cause some damage in some places. There was a substantial shadow government trying to run foreign affairs for the United States. In any other country, it would have been called a coup. Um, and they seem to have gotten away with it. Modern day pirates these days. They have escaped essentially the control of national governments, but they're available for use by national governments. Sometimes they move under color of, uh, you know, and defend themselves as advancing U.S. national interests. But I, uh, If you see off the U.S. West Coast, if you look closely near the bottom center, you can see the aircraft trailing. I don't know how visible it is to all of you, but that entire marine layer is aerosols. And all that blows in on us. And what happens when they aerosolize in the atmosphere? Again, it shreds ozone, and it diminishes and disperses rain. It reduces evaporation. This is a, t as far as the rainfall in California, it's a 2 plus 2 equals 4 equation. Now, I presented this data to, to Gavin Newsom in the Capitol two months ago in his office with his aide. There's no question they got what I passed on to them, but apparently they're too comfortable in their job still to actually do anything about this issue. And until the population is unwilling to look the other way, they'll continue to do nothing. Another picture, how obvious is that spraying? Why don't meteorologists talk about this? Because it's a bad career decision. It's a bad career decision, so they simply want to stay in their job. I've been in the field with USDA soil scientists measuring soil pHs in Shasta County with a solid USDA baseline, getting measurements 15 to 20 times above that baseline. 